Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this is a 10 plus thousand dollar Dell switch. You can see the label on this switch that says American Mega Trans T-R-A-N-D-S, but it's supposed to say American Mega Trends because that's the company name, which is T-R-E-N-D-S. This is a huge supply chain story and we're gonna walk through it on YouTube. Now, before we get too far in this, let's just say number one, that Dell and American Mega Trends have confirmed this being a thing. We also know, or we have reason to believe that it might actually be in an HPE Cray supercomputer sold to the US military. We're gonna to get to that a little bit later. We weren't able to confirm that for this video, but we do have uh, some kind of anecdotal evidence that kind of suggests that. But the implication is that because we do have an official acknowledgement of this, we have to stick to the official story. So we can tell you about the process that I went through to go and figure this whole thing out, that this affects an entire line of very high-end Dell switches. We can talk about the official statements. I can give some opportunities for improvement or things that I think is my opinion that could be improved in the process. And you know, if you want to go anywhere beyond that, well, the only thing I could tell you is that you're probably going to want to go and talk about this in the comments section. I think this one might actually have a little bit livelier of a comment section than our normal videos because um, there's a lot here. So why don't we get into it? Now at STH, we do a lot of very technical articles. And in this one, we don't really need to get into the weeds in terms of technical stuff, but we do need to just explain what one thing is, because what does American Megatrans? I mean, why is Megatrans? Why is that sticker there? What the heck is it? So the first thing that you need to know is what's called a baseboard magic controller. And we do have a guide on this on the STH main site. We'll link that in the description. We're gonna be referencing stuff throughout this video. You can go check those things out in the description of this video. But what a baseboard management controller basically is, is you can think of it like a little computer that sits inside switches, servers, storage gear, I mean, all kinds of gear out there. And what that basically does is it does things like monitors, you can issue commands, you can do all kinds of stuff so that you don't actually have to physically go and service components in the field. It's expensive to go send someone down into a data center and then have to go and plug into a machine, make sure you have the right machine. It's just a total pain. And the only way that humanity can actually scale its compute infrastructure is if we have some way Way to monitor and manage systems remotely. Now, large vendors like HPE and Dell have their own proprietary baseboard management controllers with their own software stack. HPE, for example, uses ILO, but Dell uses iDRAC. And so we always talk about the iDRAC controller when we do a PowerEdge review. That's a really good example. And you have that nice little web management page. You have all kinds of stuff in it. And while some vendors have their own silicon, what most people do, and most vendors and most hyperscalers and all those guys do, is they actually just go use an off-the-shelf baseboard management controller. And the big one there is usually an A-speed controller, so something like the AST 2500, 2600 for servers. There are lower end versions for things like switches and stuff like that, and they all have different features, but basically it is an out of band tool to be able to manage a box that's sitting in a data center or somewhere else remotely without having to go touch it. Now, I mentioned that it's kind of like a little computer, and that's important because of course, as a computer, you kind of need like an operating system and you kind of need like programs and like all that kind of stuff, right? And that's really what American Megatrends provides to the industry. They're awesome. I mean, they have absolutely great products. We use them all the time. And you know, you might use on a server something like their Megarack SPX, but in a switch, you tend to have less compute resources. And so that's why you would use something a little bit lower end, maybe like a Megarack PM. So when you see this sticker and the stickers that we're gonna talk about in this video, the easy way to think about it in in terms of analogy is like if you have a laptop. And since I just happen to have one here, we're gonna use this instead, but this is a little tiny mini micro node and you see that we have a Microsoft Windows sticker. Well, that's basically what these stickers are from American Megatrends are basically license or royalty stickers. The difference though, is that it would be like if this said, instead of Microsoft Windows, it said Microsoft Windows. That's basically what we're looking at here. So now that you understand that, that's all the technical knowledge that you need to understand what the heck is going on here. This is nowhere near something like when Bloomberg was talking about spy chips that were allegedly out there, but nobody's actually found in the wild yet. Uh, it's not like that. It's actually very easy to see. It's plain to see. Anybody can see it. And it is on the same component that Bloomberg was talking about in their 2018 piece. By the way, if you didn't know, I actually was the one that did the follow-up interview with Yossi Applebaum, who is basically their cited source for their second article, because you know they had a second article a couple of days after the big one. And I actually interviewed him and he basically uh, was pretty angry at what Bloomberg did. And so you can read that, we'll link that on the description. But if you still think that Bloomberg uh, story is real, um, just go read that interview and I think you'll totally get it. But this is a lot more concrete, but apparently it's not really an issue. So let's get into what happened and then we'll get into what's going on here. All right. so. 
let's go back to August of 2021. Towards the end of August, I said, hey, you know, I think we should go do more networking reviews. We've done some 100 gig, 400 gig switch reviews, and these are very high end, very expensive switches. And I kind of like it. Not a lot of people do those. And I said, you know, we should just go and make this a specialty that we're going to do more of on STH. And I was talking to someone at Dell at the end of August or so about like, you know, we're just kind of talking about doing reviews and stuff like that. And I was told to someone at Dell, you know, they were evaluating sites and stuff. And one of the questions they came up with was like, you know, why STH? Now for content here, STH is the largest editorially independent server storage networking review site in the world. Everybody else you can pay and they will go post, you know, whatever vendor words you want on their website. Uh, or they'll say like, you can write it, but we want to review it before it goes live. Everything that we do is done editorially independently on STH. That is a hallmark. And because we do that, we actually have a big readership. Our YouTube is still kind of small and it's still like single digit percentage of the main site, but the main site is very large and actually larger than some of the consumer sites that I've looked up to over the years uh, at this point, because we are very good at focusing in that space. So even though I knew the answer and I knew kind of like why they were doing that, I'm still an A-type personality. So I said, okay, heck with this. I'm going to go prove to them and show them exactly why STH. And since I was thinking networking at the time that we did this, I said, okay, well, let's go get some Dell switches. I'll just go buy them and then we'll go review them and I'll show Dell our impact. It'll be very clear to them the fact that we have impact. So on September 5th, I purchased three different models. Now, the first model, of course, was the Dell S5148FON. And we did a review of that. We even had a video of that, which you can find online. We'll go and we'll you know link that in the description. But that was the first one that we did. And Dell did something a little bit different in that switch. If you want to go watch it, go ahead. But we still wanted to kind of get back and do a couple more switches. And so we bought some other ones that I thought were interesting as well. One of those was the Dell S5232FON, which is a 32 port, 100 gigabit ethernet switch. Incredibly awesome and fast switch. And that was the next one that we did a review of. And so we published the review on the STH main site and we did a review of that one as well. But YouTube had something special in store for us. Specifically, we got a comment that basically said American Megatrans on the BMC. What is that? And I remember reading that comment and thinking like, hey, what is this guy talking about? And so I went and I said, okay, well, let me go look at the photos and see. And we had done not just the S5232FON, which is the 32 port 100 gig switch. We also did the S5296FON, which is like a giant 100 plus port switch. Uh, we did them at basically the same time because we do batch things like that totally happened. And so I had photos from both and we had the B-roll from both. And I looked and I said, well, let me go look and see if it really says Megatrans. So I looked at the photos and sure enough, both of these still photos for both of the switches, they said American Megatrans, T-R-A-N-D-S, not trends, T-R-E-N-D-S. And I thought to myself, okay, well, sure, we have this, you know, giant Canon R5 and, you know, fancy lenses and stuff. And maybe that's just an optical illusion. So I remember that we did the B-roll on a Sony camera. And so I said, okay, let's go look at the Sony camera and see if, you know, Sony also had that same optical illusion. And it turned out that they did. It was Megatrans, not Trends. So to get a third perspective, I actually walked to the studio and I said, okay, let me go look in there and see if I can just open these things up and if they actually say Megatrans. And guess what? It did. Both of them did actually. And that is totally interesting, right? Because I looked at it, Rohit looked at it, probably whoever, you know, made the switches looked at this. We also had tens of thousands of people watch that video, tens of thousands or however many people went and actually read the article and nobody noticed this other than one commenter on YouTube. And that I thought was just amazing that they managed to find this. So later that day, I actually just took the little photo and I put it on Twitter and everybody was like, whoa, what, what is Megatrans? Because it's Megatrans. And American Megatrans is very well known in the industry. So this was totally weird. Also on October 4th, I actually sent a note in to the American Megatrans and I went on the website, found their legal form and I said, hey, um, I just opened these switches and they say American Megatrans, T-R-A-N-D-S, not American Megatrans, T-R-E-N-D-S. And I've also had spent a little bit of time looking through some of our old photos on STH because, you know, we have like a library of just giant photos. I mean, even more that get published on the main site. And I was like, uh, I've seen it on some other vendors as well. Like, is this, is this, do you know about this? Like, what the heck's going on? Now, I didn't get a note back on the 4th because it's already kind of late in the day by the time I had sent that, but I did get a response on the 5th. And the response that I got from American Megatrans Trans headquarters in Georgia was not like, oh, yeah, we know about this. This is, you know, just a thing. Somebody to typo. Hey, I make typos all the time. Sure. But they said, uh, we need to do a little bit more investigation. Now, I'm not going to go into the entire conversation because I said I wouldn't. But just suffice to say, on October 5th, I did not come away from that conversation saying like, okay, these guys definitely know what the heck is going on. 
And so I told Dell and I said like, hey Dell, uh, I think I found something uh, that I'm investigating. I think I may have found some hardware issue. Uh, you know, it's in these switches. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. And one of the things that the Dell guys actually came back and it was actually really insightful was like, hey, well, how do you know that the units that you purchased, how do you know that it wasn't like a reseller, rogue reseller that had swapped some hardware or something like that? And I thought like, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. I bought these all from one reseller. Could have just been a rogue reseller that made these little boards and put them together and put them in the switch that nobody would ever see or care about. So that's totally possible. So that's why on October 7th, I was thinking about, well, how do we go and figure out like, you know, a way to know that it's not just a rogue reseller. And that's why I actually went and purchased two more switches. Now, because the first reseller was in the Southeast US, I said, okay, well, let me go publish or purchase it from a different reseller in maybe like the Midwest or something like that. And so we actually got the Dell S5248 FON, which is like a 48 port switch. And we got that from another reseller in the US. But then I said, okay, well, maybe it's the US supply chain. And so what if I went and got an international unit? And so I decided to go and get the less expensive one because you know, you're know shipping things internationally and it costs a lot of money. So we got a uh, Dell S5224 FON that came from an international seller. And so I knew that we had you know four different models of these switches. They were from three different resellers and two different countries. So Clearly, if all of these had the same board, then we knew that it's probably something upstream and not just a rogue reseller. So the following week was an event for Dell, which was Dell Technology Summit. And during that week, we actually got the other switches and the, both of those switches, of course, had American Mega Trans, not American Mega Trans as well. So it seems like it is just a feature of all of these switches in the Dell S5200 line. Again, a very high-end switch line, which seemed kind of weird. At the same point, all the Dell folks you know, they had Michael Dell, they had everybody on this Dell Technology Summit thing. So everybody's really focused on that. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I'm gonna give you 24 hours to go figure out what's going on Dell, but we're not gonna do it this week because you're not gonna have bandwidth to go do it. And I don't wanna ruin your event. Instead, let's do it the following week. I'm gonna give you, we're gonna have lunch. I'm gonna show you the evidence. And then you're gonna have 24 hours to get back to me. Otherwise, peace is going live. So the lunch meeting was set for October 19th. And when I walked into that meeting, I had not heard anything from the American Megatrans headquarters. All the last thing I think I heard was like on October 5th or something like that, where they said like, hey, yeah, you know, we're doing some investigation. So they had like two weeks, hadn't heard anything. And I'm walking into this meeting with Dell just to kind of set the stage. So on October 19th, after lunch, hadn't heard anything. I basically pulled out the iPad and I said, look, here's the one that you can find, which is the S5232FON. And you can find that on YouTube. You can go see this stuff. So your people probably have already seen it, but that's uh, that's out there. And then also here is the S5296FON. And this is one that we haven't published yet, but you know certainly this has the same thing. Here's also the S5248FON, same thing. And here's the S5224FON, again, same thing. And as you know, I don't do these with a script. So that is a bit of a tongue twister just to remember and get out. But before that lunch meeting and at, when I'm showing this off, I said, look, Dell, you have 24 hours to get back to me with like, what the heck is going on? Otherwise, I'm just gonna go release a story because you know I have four switches, I have enough evidence and any anybody can see that this does not say American Megatrans, it says American Megatrans. Now they asked why 24 hours and I didn't exactly tell them, but my reasoning for 24 hours was really simple. I figured if Dell actually knew about this, then they would already have documentation and it would be a relatively simple exercise to say, look, we knew about this, here's the documentation. Some executive is probably gonna have to go you know, bless it and say, okay, it's okay to go disclose this, but we know about it. And then once I get that, I can't say like, uh, this does not look right. I used to do big firm consulting. So I definitely knew that if something is in the fast path and you already have that kind of stuff, you can usually get those things out no problem in an afternoon, if not by the next day. So it should not be an issue if somebody already knew what was going on. However, I've also worked with really big companies on complex issues like this. And something that you know if you've ever done that is that stuff doesn't happen in 24 hours because you have to go talk to so many people that are online at different times and stuff like that. And it's just a nature of being a big company. So my thought was that if I got an answer within 24 hours or somebody came back to me and said like, hey, we already know what's going on that afternoon, I would know that they knew about this. And if it went longer than 24 hours, I knew that they would have had to go do like an investigation, create documentation on it, and then, you know, bless the answer, send it out. And that would take over 24 hours. So they would not be able to get back to me. So that was really the, you know, kind of other reason that I was doing this 24 hour thing. Again, given the fact that I knew that VMware was going to spin off on November 1st, it would have looked really, really bad if, you know, Dell Technologies and VMware were selling a joint solution where they had a not valid license sticker 
uh, being sold as part of that solution because if you know you sell software, it's not really good to go and have not licensed or not properly licensed software of your competitors uh, or suppliers in your solution, right? So like I was pretty sure that I would get a pretty fast response if there was at least you know something around that. And of course, for anybody that says, hey, you should have just published this because that would have been wildfire if you had done it. You shouldn't have waited this long. You shouldn't have talked to Dell about it. Like, come on guys, like I don't wanna do this stuff at all. This is not what we do at SDH. We do hands-on reviews. So frankly, you know, I'm gonna go work with them on it and say, like, hey, I don't wanna, I don't wanna pull this out of nowhere on you and you wake up and read it in the morning. I want you to know what's going on and have an opportunity to say, like, hey, actually, we knew about this. This is what's going on. So, of course, by the afternoon of October 19th, after lunch, I did get a response from them, but it was not like, oh, we know about this. Actually, they were like, hey, we want to know what resellers uh you bought this from. And my response to them was like, hey, um, you know four different platforms, four different switches and, and different models, uh, three different resellers, two different countries. This is an upstream supply chain issue. And in fact, there's an easy way that you can go validate this because it's probably on all of them. And when I was like 16 years old, I taught tennis, but then I also had another job. And that job was basically, I worked in a Cisco factory in the RMA department. So I know that at networking vendors, there are RMA departments and that they have tons of boards and switches just kind of sitting around as they're in that RMA process. And because of that, I said, well, why don't you just go call up your RMA guys and say like, hey, can somebody go or does have somebody have one of these things open? Because most likely they're gonna see a Megatrans sticker in there as well, given what we found. You should not be looking at me this afternoon. You should be going and looking at, you know, what's upstream and try figuring that out. Now I was flying on the morning of October 20th, but I did get a ping before I got on the plane saying, hey, uh, actually American Megatrends, they say it's a typo. We're going to get something to you at some point. And so I said, yeah, I'll hold the story because I knew I was going to hold the story and that this call was going to come anyway. But, you know, I said, yep, no problem. I'll go, I'll go hold that. No big deal. And again, I make plenty of typos, so this is totally possible. Now on October 21st, I actually got a response from AMI. Finally, and instead of reading it out, I'm gonna just put it up here, but they basically acknowledge the fact that there is a typo. And they also said that there's no legal issues. So like you wouldn't be like pirating software if you had one of these labels. And they finally said, we're gonna to continue to use this label, which I thought was crazy, but we're gonna to continue to use this label. At some point later, American Megatrends out of their Taiwan office actually had sent a letter, it was an affirmation letter. And they sent that to another party that's redacted as well as Dell. And they basically said, same thing you know, no legal consequence, it's a typo. And that label is, with the typo, is still gonna be implemented and shipped by AMI. Again, remember, this is the equivalent of Microsoft Windows and Microsoft just saying, yeah, whatever, we're just gonna keep shipping it. Now, a couple things with this, if you wanna read it more, we'll have it on the STH main site, but a couple things with this. First off, there are some redacted portions. My guess is that that's probably the ODM. We don't know because it's redacted, but Dell doesn't you know, usually manufacture these switches. There's usually an ODM. So there's usually some other party that goes and will go put all the stuff together. They'll get these labels, put them on, and then it goes to Dell. Dell sells it as their own. Of course, we don't know who that is. So that's just a little bit of speculation. It could say anything under the redaction. Okay, so at this point, what we basically got to by the 21st, 22nd of October was the point that we could say that, yep, Wando's stickers, they're fine, just like we can have Megatrans. Now, other things in this affirmation letter that you're gonna notice is that they're actually using one of our photos. And so, and it's also dated the 21st of October. So what is important here is the date because this is after one, I brought it and way after I brought it to AMI. Two, it's kind of, you know, after I brought it to Dell as well. So this is not something that they had, you know, sitting around and they just kind of redacted a little bit and sent out to me. Instead, this is something that they made specifically in a response to what I had sent. And let's kind of go through what must have happened based on just the events and what we saw in terms of, you know, what feedback we got from the companies. And again, I know there are probably some people that are not gonna believe that this is the official story, but this is literally what we have. I did have people when I was kind of showing this beforehand saying like, oh, well, those are clearly counterfeit stickers and they're just trying to cover it up. But I don't believe that could be the case. I mean, you know, that was just the comments that I got from you know some folks that I brought it to. So again, I don't think that's possible. I doubt you would, but you would probably tell me in the comment section if you thought that was possible. Instead, let's kind of go through the chain of like what would have to go wrong for this to actually be the case. And let's just kind of go through that real quick. So. I guess what would happen is that AMI in Taiwan needed to have local licensed stickers. And so instead of just going saying like, hey, can we use that 2003 sticker template, right? Because it says copyright 2003. Instead of using that old template, what if instead, what if we just made our own and we're just gonna make it look kind of the same, but we're not gonna use the template that we already have. 
And in that process, they managed to misspell their company name. And at that point, they would have had to go print out the stickers. They would have had to not notice that the stickers were misspelled or they were you know, basically looking at the stickers, seeing that they were misspelled and saying, you know what, whatever. Those stickers would have to go to the ODM and the ODM that makes those switches for Dell would have to have accepted either, you know, the PCB with those switches or those stickers already attached, or, you know, they would have had to put them together themselves and they would have had to say, okay, I know that I got this from American Megatrends, but it says American Megatrans. And so, yeah, no big deal. Sure, the names don't match, but what's the difference between getting Windows and Windows anyway? Now, after the ODM actually built a switch, they sent them to Dell and Dell would have had to do their supply chain diligence. So they would probably look at that and say, hey, you know, either A, they didn't see it or B, they said, yeah, it's fine, no big deal. What we do know though, is that there wasn't like documentation or didn't seem to be any documentation made because this was not widely known. The US office of American Megatrends had no idea about this when I had asked them. And then also Dell, it took them a long time to get the answer. So they obviously had to go do some investigation, even though I had already given American Megatrends the heads up like over two weeks earlier that, hey, I had found this thing in Dell switches. But these switches are also 2019 switches. So for me to find it and for nobody to have any idea about this, that also means that it would have had to go through like the Dell RMA departments and like all those kind of things. Like every Anybody else, anybody else that could have seen an open switch would have probably missed it. Now I can totally understand that because like I missed it, Rohit missed it. I mean, everybody seems to have missed this because it looks so close that you just don't read it. And the other thing that's important is that the letter, the affirmation letter from AMI did not reference another you know, artifact, right? There was nothing that said in that letter that was brand new, something that said like, hey, as we told you in 2019, this is fine. Instead, it's just all new stuff. And so we don't know what it says under the redaction, but it does seem to say like, you know, if, if this really was a thing and everybody knew about it, they would have said like, oh yeah, uh, remember that, that note that we sent you like two years ago, that's what's going on here. And the other thing is that these stickers that don't say the right company name are going to continue to be sold, which is um, really kind of interesting, isn't it? So now that we've gone through, you know, what the timeline and what the process was that we gathered this information and just kind of talked about that, I think we can start talking about what I think might be some process improvements. Now, first off, Dell is widely regarded in the industry as having excellent supply chain, but clearly it seems like something could be a little bit better here. I mean, when the original Bloomberg supply chain article came out, there were literally people that like, you know, took their servers or supermicro servers and they would go and like, you know, have them x-rayed, didn't find anything, right? But they were so freaked out, like that happened and they're literally getting them x-rayed. But then, you know, this is something that literally anybody can open this up and see that there's a miss, there's something weird about the sticker and nobody's talked about it for two years. This was literally one of you, a YouTube commenter that figured out that there was something weird about this sticker. It wasn't Dell, it wasn't the STH team, it wasn't anybody else, it was somebody on YouTube. And it feels like if it's something that's easy enough for somebody to catch on YouTube, then Dell, since they are supposed to have a very tight supply chain and very good supply chain security, this is something that just kind of feels like they should have caught earlier in the process. I mean, the ODM could have said, hey, American Megatrans, no, we want it to say American Megatrans, not American Megatrans. Dell could have said, no, you know, we don't want it to say American Megatrans. We want it to say American Megatrans. If you think about it, if you went into a Louis Vuitton store, you bought a Louis Vuitton bag and it came out and it said, hey, this is a Louis Vuitton, you'd probably say like, uh, yeah, uh, except I want the Louis Vuitton bag, not a Louis Vuitton bag. So uh, let me let me get the real one, not this thing. And that didn't happen here. So I think that's definitely an area for improvement. The other thing though, is that these stickers are continuing to ship. I mean, that makes it really hard if somebody were to go out and make an American Mega Trans sticker, that would make it really difficult for somebody to go and be able to tell if they had a legitimate royalty sticker or if they had, you know, a pirated or a counterfeit royalty sticker, right? Because it doesn't say American Megatrends. And also I do think that the Dell folks did do a good job of getting back to me and actually hunting this thing down. I know it probably led to some sleepless nights for folks, so I'm sorry. But at the same time, at least we do have an answer and we have the official answer on what the heck's going on here. Now, because I had done some research and I kind of saw something from HPE, I had given them the same opportunity. HPE, on the other hand, did not run it down. So this is probably gonna be the first time that they're gonna hear about this. This all goes back to some photos that I just kind of was looking through at Supercomputing 2018. There, HPE and Cray, so HPE purchased Cray, and as part of that, they had their new systems, they had these giant booths, it was super cool, it was a great time. And if you didn't see it, we just did a liquid cooling and also top 10 of Supercomputing 21. So you can definitely go check those out on YouTube. We'll again link those in the description. However, 
When we went to the HPE booth, we took apparently a picture, and this picture says this is a Cray CS500. And for those that don't know what 2U four node servers are, they basically are 2U boxes, and there are four dual socket nodes. You can get a total of eight processors and all their memory stuffed into a 2U box, which is, means that you get a lot of density, and that's what the high performance computers want, like supercomputers. That's kind of a model that those folks use. And that's exactly what this box is, and that's this photo. Now, typically, you wouldn't find find Megarack PM on a like server node, so you wouldn't normally see it in the system. However, this particular one was based on an ODM design, and in the corner, you can actually see that there is a chassis management controller. And the idea there is basically instead of having like four different network ports, one for each of the different nodes, you can just have one port and then manage everything all centrally off of one port. It saves cabling. It's just kind of a nice feature, but typically for that, you use a lower end A-speed BMC, and that also might be something that you'd use Megarack PM for. And when I looked at photos of the chassis management controller, it of course said American Megatrans. So I did a little bit of research and I said, okay, well, nobody actually used the CS500, right? And I was wrong. So I went on the top 500 list, which is the top 500 supercomputers in the world. And something that we saw was that the, you know, HPE Cray system was based on the CS500, went into a system called Freeman. Now Freeman debuted at number 123 on that top 500 list in June of 2020. On the November 2021 list that just came out, it's down to like 185 or something like that. So it's definitely down a little bit, but it's still definitely a top 200 supercomputer. Now, usually these supercomputers have, you know, where they're installed. And this one had an interesting one because it said ERDC DSRC. And there you can see that it's in Vicksburg, but there's also a website. And while you might not be familiar with the entire URL, what you might notice is that it says army.mil. So of course I clicked on the link and what did I find? But I was at the US Army Corps of Engineers, Engineer Research and Development Center. So that's ERDC. So what we don't know about this HP system is we actually don't know if the system that we saw on the show floor at Supercomputing 2018 is the same thing that got installed with the US military. We don't know that, right? Because they could have not put that chassis management controller they could have said, hey, actually, we want we want the American Mega Trends, not trans stickers. So of course, when HPE did their supply chain checks, they probably would have seen that. But at the same time, I know we have a lot of readers in the Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland area. And so what I would say is if you do happen to work on Freeman or you know somebody that does, it might be worth sending them this article and saying, hey, maybe you should go take five minutes, open up a node and just double check, because if you do see American Mega Trans, you're probably gonna wanna go call up HPE and say, hey guys, what's going on? Make sure you get that affirmation letter so that way you can be sure that your royalty stickers are actually genuine and they're not some kind of something else. All right, so just kind of, let's kind of get some takeaways. So first thing I think is a challenge is just, just number one, like it's crazy the fact that one of you on YouTube figured out the fact that this thing is not right. Everybody else in the supply chain apparently didn't notice this, but somebody on YouTube actually figured this out. And that was the first time somebody figured this out. So congratulations. But at the same time, because it says mega trans, not mega trends, and American mega trends is not like reprinting these things. Well, I mean, how would you know now if you had a royalty sticker that was a counterfeit or a genuine one? It would be like really hard to figure that out. And so that's kind of a weird thing. But of course, if you knew that, you know, for two plus years, you'd been selling these stickers with these typos in it, you would probably say like, hey, if somebody goes and looks at the sticker later and they're doing research, they're probably gonna go type in AmericanMegatrans.com. Or maybe there'd be a hyphen and they would do American-Megatrans.com and maybe they would look up that. And so we should probably go register the domain name so that way somebody nefarious doesn't go and pick up that domain name and redirect them to some site. So it just so happens on October 22nd, somebody did have that idea. Okay, so this clearly is not the industry's finest moment. We all know that. Let's just call it what it is. Now, if there's nothing else that you take from this, just know that supply chain security is a big deal. Remember, these are very high end, 10 plus thousand dollar switches. I mean, these things are very expensive. And you know, if something that you can see with the naked eye very easily can go and pass all of these different steps and not get detected until you know somebody on YouTube literally finds it, well, you know, 
What about the kind of cheaper devices? That kind of makes you a little bit nervous, right? Like, I mean, what about those $500 boxes, $1,000 boxes? I mean, th that kind of gets you a little bit nervous and that's why supply chain security is so important. So if there's nothing else that you take from this video, that should be the key takeaway. Now, again, I mentioned a whole bunch of things that are gonna be linked in the description. So definitely go check that out. Feel free to leave comments and let me know what you think about this. And as always, if you like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.